This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the wonderful people at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA exists to support, encourage, facilitate animal studies scholars ASA does a lot for animal studies scholars and also animal artists. So it does things such as organising a conference every two years and we've got everything crossed that we will be able to have our conference next year. It has a regular newsletter that brings you all the latest news from the world of animal studies and it's also got a vibrant Facebook page. So if you're not a member of ASA, please think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, the other sponsor for this episode is, of course, Animal Publics. Animal Publics is a book series that comes out of Sydney University Press. Uh, The wonderful people at Sydney University Press, Agata, who manages the series, emailed me just yesterday. She's really on the ball, very passionate about animal issues. And, of course, the book series is edited by... um, two wonderful animal study scholars, Melissa Boyd and Fiona proven Rapsi. So if you've not checked out Animal Publics, please think about doing it. All you need to do is put Animal Publics, Sydney University Press into Google and you'll be introduced to a whole lot of fabulous books. Okay, let's get down to business. Well, alas, it's still the age of COVID. I'm in Sydney, Australia, where we're feeling a little bit nervous because things are not going terribly well in Victoria and we're on a bit of high alert here in New South Wales. But I'm joined by another wonderful international guest, someone who I'm just so thrilled to have on the program, but who I've never met in person. And of course, as you know, I used to do the episodes face-to-face, so I was restricted to interviewing people that, of course, I was in the same room as. But in the age of COVID, while we've lost a lot of things, we've gained the opportunity to connect more fully online. So this week, I'm joined by Claire Palmer. Claire is Professor of Philosophy at Texas A&M, and today we're going to discuss Claire's upcoming book chapter, Should We Provide the Bare Necessities? Climate Change, Polar Bears and the Ethics of Supplement Feeding. Now this is going to come out in a book called Animals in Our Myths, which is co-edited. Now I'm going to get these names wrong, unfortunately, even though I know the people and think they're wonderful. (laughs) Bernice Bovenkirk and Joseph Kulatz, and it's published by Springer. Excuse me, in 2020. Claire, how did I go with those names? Sounds good to me. I don't think I would have done any better. (laughs) Well, Claire, can you tell us why you wrote this chapter? Yeah, sure. So the chapter is about a specific case. So starving polar bears uh, due to climate change. And that connects to something I'm really interested in, which is what we owe wild animals ethically. And in particular, what we owe them, if anything, Uh, in the context of climate change. So that's the broad uh, context of the the chapter. And I actually wrote it because in 2013, a group of polar bear researchers published a paper in Conservation Letters, which is one of the main conservation journals, uh, in which they talked about this particular problem. So the situation is this, with respect to polar bears, that they, um, in the summer, Certain polar bear populations, so in the southern part of their range, come onto the mainland um, because the sea ice that they normally catch seals off has melted. And so they stay on the land and they uh, don't really eat anything. They live on their stored fat during that time. And then the sea ice comes back in the autumn and they go back out on the ice and start catching seals again. However, because of climate change, the ice is melting out sooner uh, and the bears are on, have to come onto land sooner and then the ice is forming later so they can't get back on the ice to hunt seals and so that's causing problems with their nutrition. 
And the prediction is within the next 10, 15 years, there will come a year when the bears starve to death. Uh, because they can't get back on the ice in time to feed themselves from hunting seals from the ice. So, uh, and in fact, there was some research published this week talking about that very issue uh, in nature climate change. So it's now, a, you know, acknowledged problem. So the scientists in this paper sort of started talking about, well, what can we do about this? Or should we do anything about this? And proposed a series of possible things that they could do. Uh, their concern was with polar bear populations. So they were interested in conservation in particular, not with the suffering of individual polar bears. Uh, my interest was really in the suffering of individual polar bears, but the solutions that they discuss, in as much as they are solutions, uh, were really um, the same ones that you would think about with individual bears. Um, and the one that they were most positive about was supplementary feeding. So giving the bears... Uh, food to keep them going until they could get back on the ice. But that raises all kinds of issues. So my paper looks at this particular question from perspectives both in animal and environmental ethics. So I really came into animal ethics through environmental ethics. Uh, and I use the case to think about a wider set of issues about what we owe wild animals, especially when we've caused suffering to them, um, even when that's unintentional, as in the case of climate change, and to think about whether supplementary feeding is an appropriate strategy to use and whether it can be ethically justified. So that's a long background uh, on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Claire, this is, I, I really enjoyed the article. I thought it was absolutely, I beg your pardon, the chapter. I thought it was fabulously interesting. And it struck me that it really speaks to a number of, pressing and key questions for our time. Can you tell me, is there something special about climate change within this context that we need to think about? Or is this the way you puzzle through this question, could it be equally transposed to a whole range of human natural interactions and questions around our, our impact on the natural world? Okay, so that's that's a great question. Um, well, I'm going to take a, a step back in answering that. I bet you hate it when people do that. So, um, <laughs> so one thing I think is interesting is that there's a real difference um, between the kinds of problems that animal ethics in particular has historically been mo most interested in, which has really been issues about uh, farmed animals and issues about laboratory animals in particular, which were uh, where there's sort of intentional harm that's being caused to animals for some human purpose. Um, and you can see, obviously, why that's been really important. Huge numbers of animals, huge amounts of suffering. Uh, it's an obvious real issue for animal ethics. And so wild animals were not that much talked about earlier on, I think, in animal ethics, except in as much as hunting was, a, was something that people talked about. And again, that's a case of deliberate harm. What's interesting about climate change is that nobody intended to cause it the harm to animals from climate change. So it's not as if, you know, you get in your car and you start it up and you release all that carbon dioxide and you think, yeah, wow, that's doing it for the polar bears, right? I mean, that's, it's not an intentional harm. It's an unintentional harm, but nonetheless, it's still uh, causing suffering. So we have to think about, you know, do we, do we actually have moral responsibilities to try to assist wild animals we've unintentionally caused to suffer? And there are other things that are like that. So that's where it might apply to a range of other problems with wild animals. So for instance, when we develop an area that has wild animal populations, you know, the goal of the development isn't to displace animals, but nonetheless, it has those effects. Uh, climate change causes fires, like in Australia, which, which killed large numbers of sentient animals. No one intended to cause that, but still, the same kinds of questions are raised. So I do think that there's a range of issues with wild animals where humans are causing harms that they didn't intend to cause that raise a question about, well, does, it, does the fact that it's intentional or not make a difference? Um, and I argue in this paper and in other places that even though we don't, even though we don't intend these harms, um, we, we, we do have responsibilities to do something about them. Now that's qualified in various kinds of ways, but that's, and I can say more about that, but that's what I think about those sorts of issues. Wonderful. So you, in the chapter, you, you 
um, consider a range of different responses to the situation the polar bears are in, and it includes, as you've already said, supplementary feeding. Another option is to do nothing. Another option, I think, is euthanasia. Can you talk us through what the various options were and what you concluded in relation to them? Yeah, sure. So uh, I took the options from the discussion in the scientific paper because, I, I mean, I have no special expertise on polar bear management. It's not one of my sidelines. So I thought that I, I should um, say, well, this is what the scientists are talking about. They actually have some options that I didn't discuss in any detail in the paper. So they talk about relocation um, and they talk about potentially putting polar bears in zoos and so on. Um, but they're not at mm. all enthusiastic about relocation in the wild. Um, there aren't where polar bear territory is uh, already existing, where it would be suitable for bears. There are already bears. And so you would then just create overcrowding in various places. So they, they dismiss mm. the idea of moving. And one of the things I should say is that I do think that that might be appropriate for other species, but uh, it, I don't think it would work for polar bears. Um, and so uh, euthanasia. So when I in the in the course of the paper, I do I say, look, I think that there are reasons, ethical reasons, why we might want to feed bears and why that might be the best of the available options. But I can also see that there are reasons why there are also objections, ethical objections to feeding bears, and that for some people, those objections are going to be so strong that the better alternative is euthanasia. Um, and that's going to be better on almost any ethical view in which you're worried about suffering than letting bears starve to death. So if you're worried about bears suffering, I think, then you're going to have to say, well, we should, if we can do this without harming any other, anyone else, we should shoot these bears. Um, but there really aren't any other good options, I think, other than, so basically in the end, I think it comes down to either we feed them or we shoot them. Um, as mm. as the kind of ethical alternatives. So I think so perhaps there will be people listening who will be thinking to themselves, well, if they're the choices, then it's obvious you just feed them. But as you point out in the paper, there are a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration when making that decision, not least of all what it means for the animals that will become the bear's food. Can you explain why supplementary feeding isn't as kind of self-evidently um, a good solution as you might think? Yeah, I mean, so this is what I, I think this is really interesting. And this applies, some of these issues apply to lots of different cases of supplementary feeding. So uh, other, other kinds of animals too. So first of all, there's a problem that supplementary feeding may not actually help the animals that you're trying to help. Um, because sometimes when you feed wild animals, they get diseases at the feeders or they fight with one another. Uh, and so you are trying to bring about a good solution and it doesn't happen. And that could be true with the bears. So there might be a worry about this could cause more immediate suffering for bears or just make the situation worse. There could be a worry that if you feed bears near human populations, the bears might start moving into human communities and start attacking people. And so then you've got human suffering to think about as well. Uh, so there are those things too. But then, as you say, there's also the concern about, well, what are we actually going to feed the bears? And bears are a very particularly problematic case if you're concerned about animal suffering because they are not only obligate carnivores, but they have to have very high fat food. And there's no kind of, at the moment, no kind of vegan substitute uh, that you could uh, give bears. They would have to eat some kind of other animal. And the options available are not very large. There are either killing seals to feed, to bring to the bears to feed them, so giving them what they would eat if they were out on the ice, or you can feed them what they call polar bear chow. And I spent some interesting time looking into polar bear chow, which is not something I ever thought I'd spend time doing, so that was fun. Um, and that's mostly made of uh, wild fish called, I think, menharden, that are very fatty, uh, and uh, pork sort of let bits of pork that are very fatty that are made into a kind of chow. Um, that's satisfactory for bears, although actually in zoos, I think only 50% of their food is made of that, but it's, it's nutritionally adequate. Um, and, but they both obviously raise problems. So if you're worried about animal suffering or you're worried about animal rights, either you're going to be killing seals 
or you're going to be uh, in, engaging with the fishing industry and with the meat industry in order to get the chow. Um, and each of those obviously has its own problems. So if you're going to go and kill, so bears eat ringed seals, that's the main kind of food that they eat. Um, those seals are also struggling with climate change effects. Um, and so if you were to kill those seals, you're actually, sort of, as it were, an animal that's also already like the bear, as it were, suffering from the injustice of climate change. You're killing them to feed another animal that's suffering from the injustice of climate change. And actually, even the researchers, the scientific researchers, think there's something ethical. They don't actually go into it, but they raise a kind of ethical query over feeding one, killing one marine uh, mammal to feed another, it's an, a, another mammal. Um, but then, of course, people might object to feeding also to feeding wild fish and um, pork to bears uh, because that's killing animals and causing suffering too. So there isn't a... One of the things that I think is so striking about this case, and I fear it is true of many of the kinds of wild animal climate change cases in particular, is that there are no good options. Everything you do looks problematic and is going to cause suffering or an injustice of some kind or other. There isn't, there are no, you know, there's only bad options. So you're essentially choosing what you think is the least worst. Yes, Claire. Yes, Claire. It's, so it really is so terribly you know, difficult. The you know, the issues that I think about predominantly are to do with industrialization of agriculture and, and that kind of thing. And in a sense, even though politically the, it's very difficult to make progress, nonetheless, it, it's not really a wicked problem. It's just a kind of a greed problem. But this seems particularly challenging. Um, I noticed that you use some, you know, really nice past guest work, you know, Donaldson and Kim Licker and... Um, also Oscar Horta, are they helping you think through this in a, in a particular way? How did you use their okay, work? Okay, so um, in terms of just in, so the general picture, the general ethical picture in terms of thinking about uh, uh, wild animals and climate change and wild animal suffering, I mean, I think that there are uh, some different kinds of things you might be worried about. So uh, I and lots of other people argue that there are potentially justice issues with respect to climate change. So that an wild animals uh, have not benefited from climate change, they've not caused climate change, uh, but they are suffering various kinds of bad effects from climate change, or at least some of them are. I mean, some of them are benefiting, but we're looking at the ones that are not. Mm. Um, and so there's a, a set of justice arguments that I think quite a lot of rights theorists would be in that group. Then there's also a group of people, including someone like Oscar Horta, uh, who are worried about wild animals suffering in general. So, and that's independent of how it was caused. So the fact that humans caused mm. it is not really important. What matters is there is wild animal suffering out there and we should try to relieve wild animal suffering when we can do it without potentially causing more suffering. Um, so in this case, you know, he would be asking, well, you know, which of the options is going to be overall least suffering? And then in the case of Donaldson and Kimlicker, um, I think they have some different and really interesting things to say about cases like this, because they argue that wild animals uh, essentially live in what they call kind of like sovereign communities, where we should respect their wildness and respect their independence and their own kind of self-management. Uh, so we should try to intervene in wild animal communities. So you might think, okay, well, then what about places like climate change? And for them, I think climate change would count as a kind of human overspill. It's a way in which humans, what humans are doing is impacting negatively on wild animal communities. But then the question is, well, that doesn't necessarily mean we should intervene if by doing so we would be undermining the sovereignty of those communities and taking away you know, animals' ability to manage for themselves. The problem is in this case that climate change is undermining the community as it is. The community is no longer really functioning some mm. of these Arctic. The seals are affected, the bears are affected, you know, all of the uh, Arctic community is affected. So it's not clear that, any, that an intervention would actually be uh, undermining sovereignty because climate change is already doing that for the wild animals. Um, so it may be that uh, this is the kind of case where for them an, inter an intervention <coughs> might be acceptable because it's a human overspill that's causing the problem and it's actually undermining the sovereignty of the community itself. Fascinating. 
well, I will keep a keen eye out to see how other theorists in the field respond to your really fabulous and very thought-provoking, if not slightly depressing. <laughs> oh, chapter. I pride myself on being depressing. <laughs> Uh, now, Claire, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for I am five ready. quick questions? Can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship? Okay, you ever so read? when I thought about this, I was sure that I did read, you know, Tom Regan and Peter Singer pretty early on in my graduate career, which is when I started reading these things. But the piece that I remember reading early on, and I I'm not don't really think this could be counted as a piece of pro animal scholarship, though maybe some would think so, was Baird Calicott's Animal Liberation: A Triangular Affair, um, which I found mm. when I read it as a graduate student, sort of deeply provocative and really quite confounding. Um, and I disagree with lots of it, um, but it really made me think about, oh, I'd never come across a view like this before. Uh, and it made me try to think, why do I disagree with that? I need to develop some arguments to respond to it. And, and some of the things I think were in that paper uh, have sort of shaped the things that I've gone on to work on. So, you know, he talks about the difference between wild and domesticated animals there and what, why we might think differently about them. And I hadn't really come across anyone arguing for that sort of view before. So it was quite influential to me, even though it wasn't a piece that I really agreed with lots in it. So I think it was a brilliant provocation. Um, and so that's why I remember it. <clears throat> Wonderful. Nothing wrong with a brilliant provocation. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship yeah, you ever Yeah, so wrote? the first thing I wrote uh, was a paper in the journal Environmental Values, which I can't bear to think of as in 1997 so 20 years ago mm -hmm. called the idea well plus mm -hmm. 20 it's not conceal those extra three mm -hmm. years called the idea of the domesticated animal contract and I argued in that paper that the relationship between human beings and domesticated animals uh, shouldn't be thought of as a kind of win-win social contract which some people were arguing at that point and I th thought this was a very strange idea I mean apart from it being unclear whether it was indeed or win for the animals I mean it might not be too bad for dogs but not so great for say chickens but that the idea of a social contract kind of implied that um, in the human case you can get out of it you know if you don't like the contract but once animals have been domesticated they're kind of trapped in a particular no future animal could get out of it because they're no longer able to be independent uh, so it didn't strike me as being a, a classic kind of social contract in the sense that we think of it in the human case because it involves a change it involves a change in animal natures so yeah absolutely so if you had to name one animal study scholar who's had a big impact on you so who I would first it be? thought about Tom Regan um, because the case for animal rights was really important to me. But in the end, I decided that I would say here, Peter Sando. Um, so he's someone I've collaborated mm. with a bit, uh, but he really encouraged me to think about much more applied issues, I think, than I was inclined to. Um, so things like, you know, indoor, outdoor cats, uh, fertility control in wild animals, what are the ethical issues that these more applied things raise? And I think that that's a really important thing for people in animal ethics to be doing. Uh, he's also does a lot of sort of interdisciplinary projects that are aimed at sort of exploring what animal welfare is, how to improve it, how to compare it. Um, and I think that that looks really important. So in a sense, in sort of a practical way, he's been a sort of model about how one might work as an animal studies scholar. Wonderful, that's fantastic. Wonderful, Thank that's fantastic. That Thank you for sharing that name. I've not come across he's his work, but University I'll check it out. You know, okay, wonderful. And what did you conclude about indoor, outdoor cats? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what we that's what I concluded about that. <laughs> okay. Well, my cats well, aren't I, here. They're not listening, so they they they're not. It's not going to occupy have, their minds today. I have two right here that want their dinner. <laughs> I could tell you that. I'm trying to keep them quiet as I'm talking to you. <laughs> What's the most important thing academics can do? So for this animals? is a really interesting question, and I. I guess there's not a single answer in as much as different disciplines 
might have different things. So if you're in animal welfare science, you might be able to do something different than if you're in English literature. But one of the things that I guess is sort of across the board academics can do, uh, and I think more people are doing this, is sort of sharing their research in a way that's accessible and approachable to the more to the general public. So this is a fantastic example, this podcast, something like this, but blogs, keeping blogs articles in the conversation, uh, newspaper articles, and also sort of collaborating in kind of teams and policy work and things like that. And more generally, just ensuring that some of the things that we produce are, are generally accessible for intelligent lay people. Uh, I think that that's really important so that what's going on in animal studies can sort of get down into general discussion and policy discussion. Absolutely. I completely agree with you, Claire. I always, um, when people say they don't want to come on the show and talk about their research, I always think they're doing something wrong. It doesn't necessarily have to be this show, but I think it's important to talk about your research in an accessible way. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human relationship, what would it Uh, be? So... I think I'm going to go at a sort of general level. So I thought about a very specific, so I'm going to cheat basically here. So to say that at a more general level, I think it would, the one thing I would change would be for people in general to take animal sentience much more seriously. Um, and that that would therefore right. obviously have knock-on effects on lots of different things. And then the more specific thing would be that would mean that there would be massive changes to the human-animal relationships manifest in industrialized animal agriculture which i'm sure other people have mentioned um but so i thought i'd just go a step up and say well if we could change if we could take sentience much more seriously then that would have that effect and many others as well Mm, wonderful well claire what are you working so the main thing i'm working on is a a book called Wildlife Ethics, The Ethics of Wildlife Management and Conservation for Wiley Blackwell. It has five authors and we're not all in the same discipline um, and we don't certainly don't all share the same views on things. So it's proving to be an interesting project. Uh, We're about halfway through, I'd say, and um, always looking for interesting cases and things to discuss. And so it's proving to be an exciting thing to be engaged in, but obviously with five people, it's not straightforward either. So, uh, yeah, it's fun. How wonderful. Well, oh, that will that be out next year, do you think, uh, or perhaps the year after? It, I think it's got to be finished by the end of next year. So it should be out by, which is what, 2021. So it should be out sometime in later in 2022. So not for a while. Right. But still fantastic. Well, Claire, how can people find out more well, about your work? Well, I have a work? department website in Philosophy at Texas a and but that's not very exciting. It does have a CV on it. I've got work on Phil Papers, academia.edu, and ResearchGate. So quite a lot of the stuff I've published is on there. But this autumn, I am planning to start a personal website and a blog on wildlife ethics. And now you see I've tied my hands, so I will have to do it. <laughs> It's so that's the plan anyway <laughs> partly for the re- partly for the reason we were talking Fantastic. about like, i think it's just it, good to have sort of um academic thoughts out there in a way that people more generally can in- can read and be interested in absolutely well claire thank you so much for coming it on was the great podcast. i've really enjoyed it thank you for running such a great thing oh my pleasure And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now, you can find us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. We're also on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And don't forget to leave a review. Reviews make it easier for other people to find the podcast. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.